Good morning, church. It is good to be back here. Um, this is my second time visiting Grace Church. It's nice to see familiar faces and um, to see some new faces as well. Um, and I, I look forward to hopefully getting the chance to meet all of you and getting a chance to talk with each and every one of you. It's funny, uh, I was wearing a hat earlier. I'm not wearing a hat now. Um, Anya and I have been talking about you know, do you wear a hat to church? Do you not wear a hat to church? Especially when you're speaking, do you wear a hat when you speak? Do you not wear a hat when you speak? Do you wear a hat when you pray? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, see, I see some hats out there. And so uh, it was funny we had this conversation. And uh, I think we build up for ourselves a lot of things about what it looks like to, to be at church, to be a follower of Christ, uh, what you feel like it should look like, what you feel like it should sound like. Um, and I'm still working through a lot of those things, but I think what I want to talk about today is this idea that Jesus, Jesus was teaching a different way from what people knew at the time. Right? He was flipping this idea of what people knew about the kingdom of God and what it meant to be the people of God upside down. Um, and you know, it's funny, I, I started with this idea of a hat, but I think it's, it's kind of a silly idea, and I think it highlights the ways in which we have built up for ourselves um, these things that we feel like make sense. Okay. So today we're going to be in Luke 19. Luke 19, you can flip there if you want, if you have a Bible, if you have a phone. Uh, you, can, you can turn there as well. Um, we're going to be reading from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. And this is what it says. Okay. Uh, it says, He entered Jericho, Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to them, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray before we continue. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that I have here today. Even though, um, yeah, I go to a different church. Father, we are one church, one body, one family, and so I come today and I stand and I worship among brothers and sisters, Father, among your people. And so God, we, um, yeah, we want to recognize that we are here not just to be in the presence of one another, but Father, that your presence is here with us. And so, so God, I, I pray, um, even just like Zacchaeus, God, that we would just catch a glimpse of you, that just a glimpse of you would be enough for us this morning, just a word from you would be enough for us this morning, that as we catch just a glimpse of you, Father, just a word from you, that, Father, we would truly be changed, we would be able to worship you for who you are, and so God, we, um, that we pray for that this morning, that you would work mighty things um, through us, and through your word, and we pray all this in Son's name, amen. I want to give us some context, okay, so a context for where we are in Luke 19, what's, what's happening, where was Jesus and what was he doing, okay, and it says that Jesus was, uh, entered Jericho and was passing through, this journey that he had started actually began in Luke 9, right, Jesus was making his way from Galilee to Jerusalem for um, this sort of entry into the great and holy city of Jerusalem, he was taking the route between Galilee and, Galilee and Samaria, and right before this it says that he was about to Enter Jericho, and now we see that he's in the city center. It just, it's interesting that the only details that Luke gives to his audience about this journey is the fact that Jesus is on a path. And if you will, he's on his way, or on a way. The idea of being on a way or the way is a large theme in Luke, and we'll be pulling from different parts of Luke because I think all these, um, all these themes, all these things that Luke is talking about are coming to a head or culminating in his approach to Jerusalem. Um, the journey was one which, uh, again, seemed to begin in the Transfiguration in Luke 9 when Jesus is spoke, speaking to Elijah and Moses. It says, that, Behold, two men were talking with him. Uh, and Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. This departure that they were talking about was Jesus' departure from his earthly ministry. We know now that his earthly ministry culminated in his death 
and resurrection on the cross, and his arrest that would lead to these events would happen in Jerusalem. The word departure is actually the same one uh, that is used to describe the Exodus. Right? So the author is preparing us to understand that this journey that Jesus is on is one that gives him the role of a new Moses, in a sense. One that leads God's people not out of the tyranny of Egypt, but out of the tyranny of sin and death. And so this journey that he's on is one in which will end in Jesus giving up his life to follow the will of his Father, to free us from sin. And so he's, he's preparing to enter Jerusalem. Okay, that's the context that we have of Jesus. Now, uh, we, we find out that he encounters, that, that, that on his way in, Jer in Jericho, that there's this man, Zacchaeus. Okay, we, we know that he's, uh, Luke tells us that he's a chief tax collector. Okay? Um, but really, what did this mean? Right? The last time I was here, we, we kind of talked a little bit about tax collectors and, and kind of what, what they were about. They were these people who were enlisted or maybe volunteered to the Roman Empire to collect taxes from their neighbors. Right? And this was especially egregious because uh, the Roman Empire was brutal in the way that they treated the people that they ruled over. Um, and for the Israelites, it was, it was a terrible thing. Right? These taxes were not even small taxes. We think taxes now are, are kind of high. But for them, they collected maybe somewhere upwards of 50%. Right? And these tax collectors who were supposed to be their friends and their family, their neighbors, they collected um, not only the 50% to fund the empire that ruled over them, but they also took extra. And they took extra so that they themselves would also be rich. And so um, they were not only backstabbers, but they were also these seedy, greasy people who would, um, who would by bad means, become rich and benefit themselves. And not only was Zacchaeus a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. He was uh, the head of the tax collectors. And so he was seen as especially bad, right? And they were these bad guys, and he was the worst of them. He was the worst of bad guys. And, and I think it's interesting, right, because no one really goes through life wanting to be the bad guy. Right? For, for Zacchaeus, I don't think that he grew up thinking that he would be some kind of villain, that he would make a name for himself doing something that he didn't want to do. Right? And yet, I think it's also worth noting that it probably meant that he valued money greatly. It was part of his identity. And I think especially worth noting that Jericho, Jericho was actually a relatively wealthy city. They had, um, I think they were known for their, their, their rare trees, for balsam trees, palm trees, sycamore trees, like the one that Zacchaeus would climb. And so they were rich. And so to be rich in Jericho meant that Zacchaeus was probably not just rich, he was filthy rich. He was like a Elon Musk or Bill Gates kind of rich. This guy was not, uh, he wasn't just anybody. And it seemed fair then to say that Zacchaeus' identity and sense of self-worth was tied into being extremely rich. Um, so much so that he didn't mind being the villain. Okay. So in that, if that's the case, I think it's really interesting to see what we, uh, to, to find what we come, next, come to next. Right? Luke tells us that, that Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small and stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Okay. Zacchaeus was rich, he was small in stature, um, but being rich, I think he had wanted some kind of power. Right? He wanted to have some kind of control over his life, some kind of pride or dignity that he could take for himself. So I think it's really interesting. He wanted to see Jesus so badly uh, that he went to climb into a, a sycamore tree. Okay. And I think this is, this is important because uh, when Jesus was passing through, he had been accumulating crowds as he went. Set, set the scene a little bit. He's accumulating crowds as he went. So as he was passing through Jericho, it probably would have been what we know as a parade. Right? He was passing through the city. People were lining the streets trying to see him. He had a large crowd following him as well. And so for Zacchaeus, a, a relatively small man, he either couldn't physically see Jesus or people didn't let him see Jesus because no one wanted to give him the time of day. Right? And so, so he had to climb this tree. Right? Uh, the culture of the time was one of honor and shame. Okay? Uh, much of one's identity was probably wrapped up into what others thought about you. And, and so image was important. So I think it's even more striking so that Zacchaeus um, kind of does this thing where he throws away whatever dignity he might have left to climb into this tree. And I, I tell you, I don't know if you, 
encounter people who are generally small in stature, but you have a, a weakness that you are very well aware of and that other people know about you that's kind of almost tied into your identity, it becomes this thing where you don't even want to acknowledge it, right? So for him, climbing into a tree and acknowledging how small he is is probably even more so throwing away his dignity. Right? To acknowledge that you cannot do this thing, to throw away your pride, he wanted to see Jesus bad. Right? So much so that he threw away whatever last shred of public dignity that he had. And I think this is what attracts Jesus to Zacchaeus, isn't it? Um, Jesus, Jesus, among this whole crowd of people, among all these people that are following him, among all the important people that were probably in Jericho, sees this man in a tree. Sees this man in a tree, and, and he stops, and he looks at him. Right? Uh, Luke tells us that when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I think this is striking. I think this is striking. When I was on a short-term mission trip in Taiwan, um, I remember I, I couldn't really... I, I am ethnically Chinese, but I don't speak Chinese very well. I grew up in the States, born in L.A. Uh, so I am uh, just a West Coast boy through and through. <laughs> and I don't speak that, I don't speak Chinese very well, but my team did, right? So they would do all these things, they would connect with people, and for me, I was like, oh, I'm kind of useless, actually. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember someone gave me this advice. Someone gave me this advice. He's like, here, I know you don't really speak very much, right? Like, you speak very much Chinese. Why don't you... Just take the time when you meet these kids, when you meet these people, simply see them. Hear what they're telling you their name is, and remember their names. And every morning, just greet them by name. And so, uh, not being able to do much else, I committed myself to remembering their names. And lo and behold, it was the greatest thing. <laughs> it was crazy how much you could just look at someone, say hello, you know, John, or hello, Natalia, and just remember their names. And, it meant the world, right? You could connect with him on that level. And Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, I see you. I know you. And not only that, but hurry and come down for a bus. Stay at your house. Jesus, I think, he simply saw people who were either invisible to others or who were actively ignored. What's more, I think Jesus was attracted to Zacchaeus because this man was so willing to give up his dignity just to catch a glimpse of who he was. For, Zacchae for Zacchaeus, I think there was a sense that he felt seeing Jesus was worth whatever he had to give. Right? Whatever, was, whatever it was, it was worth it. In a sense, Zacchaeus was rich, but he was probably also poor socially, and even further impoverished himself to see and meet Jesus. Not even to meet Jesus, just to see him. And I think there's a comparison that has to happen here. In the previous chapter, in Luke 18, Jesus actually meets a rich young ruler. Okay. And this is what happens in that story. The rich young ruler approached Jesus and asked him this question, how might I inherit um, the kingdom of heaven? Right? And Jesus responded, you know, all the things that you're supposed to do, follow all these laws, follow what the prophets have said. And the rich young ruler, expecting this answer, boasted about all that he had done and all the laws that he had kept. Jesus then goes on and says, good. Now, uh, why don't you go and sell everything that you have? And, and the rich young ruler went away sad. Right? He went away sad. Um, he had expected this answer. He expected to know what it was about to enter the kingdom of heaven, to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, good for you. Now there's also this, right? Give up everything. And, and, and to be fair, Jesus' own disciples were astonished. Right? They were surprised. Peter says to Jesus, and I think almost, almost looking for reassurance, we've left our homes to follow you. And Jesus encouraged them that anyone who has left home, or father, or mother, or brothers, or children, will receive many times more now and in eternity. And I think, again, Zacchaeus didn't even dare to approach Jesus, not like this rich young ruler. He didn't dare assume that he had done all the things right. He knew exactly what his life looked like. He just wanted a glimpse of who Jesus was. And rather than boast about all that he had done or the riches he had had, he could have used maybe his wealth to leverage a meeting with Jesus. He didn't do that. He gave up. He gave up his dignity again. He had climbed into a tree just to catch a glimpse. And Jesus' promise rings true. He says, those who give up what is dear to them to follow him, and in, Jesus, in Zacchaeus' case, just to catch a glimpse of him, are rewarded. Right? And Jesus rewards Zacchaeus by seeing him, acknowledging him, and asking to dine with him. 
And Zacchaeus was delighted to have Jesus invite himself over. It, it was a great honor, I think, to, to house and to, um, to sit with a visiting scholar or a rabbi. Um, much more so than to host Jesus. Right? This man who was creating this huge stir in Jericho, who had crowds following him, who had attracted all of these people. And if, again, Zacchaeus was right about his hunch about how important Jesus was, and even more so exciting for him. Um, and Jesus invited himself over. Okay. Uh, but what we find out next is that uh, it says they all grumbled. These people that were with Jesus and around the scene grumbled. Um, who exactly is grumbling? Again, the Greek tells us, and, and the ESV tells us that uh, it's all, this word all. Right? I think in previous uh, stories or parables, it would be the, the, the Pharisees that were grumbling. Right? These select people, these elite people. But it says that all were grumbling. And I think this is really interesting, right? Because it's kind of odd, right? This isn't the first time that Jesus has gone to sit and eat with a sinner or a tax collector. Uh, but I think maybe Jesus is just upping the ante a little bit. And I think it, it, it reminds us of how poorly people thought of Zacchaeus as a, as a chief tax collector. Right, that even these people, who, these, maybe even sinners, Jesus' own disciples who had, who had seen Jesus do all these wonderful things, thought, oh man, but Zacchaeus? Really? You're going you're gonna to sit with this guy and you're going to eat with him? And I think part of it was they were also scared. Right? The Pharisees had at that point instituted this, this idea that Israel had to be faithful, righteous, and clean. Uh, in order to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven, or to come, right? And again, they were under this brutal Roman rule, and so they thought that maybe we just have to be good, and God will overthrow these oppressors. And so they were a little bit scared. This rabbi, Jesus, was going to sit with this man who was unclean, this betrayer, someone who they had cut off from Israel. And so part of it was, they were scared. What if, what if this ruins things for us? I think people weren't happy. They, they were grumbling because it was displeasing to them what Jesus was doing. And I think on one hand, right, again, Jesus, what Jesus is doing here is he is just continuing and upping the ante on upending the social order that the Pharisees and the scribes have worked so hard to create and to, to protect. And so they hated him. And on the other, even the people that were following Jesus didn't deem Zacchaeus someone who was worthy for Jesus to approach. And that's really hard, right? Um, and, and I think the thing is, Jesus, neither Jesus nor Zacchaeus denied that Zacchaeus is a sinner. Neither of them denied that fact. But Zacchaeus does stand up. He does stand up and he says something. He says... He says this, right? He says, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. I think this reminds us of, it reminds me of what happens in Luke 3. John the Baptist is preaching this message of repentance, that the kingdom of heaven is near. And what do you say? People are like, oh man, then what, what do we do? Right? John, what do we do? Okay, and he, and he he's, he says this, right? He, he said to, therefore to the crowds that came out to, the, to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Repentance has this idea of turning from your way. The Greek word repent for repentance. Turning from your way. Turning from the things that you care about. Turning from the things that benefit you to do the will of God. Again, we have this idea of, of a way being told here by Luke. People have this way that they think Jesus, Zacchaeus had lived his whole life for these riches that he had. So much so, again, that he, he was willing to to become the greatest of villains in his society and his culture. And he was willing to give all of that away. Not just, in fact, in, John, in Luke 3, it says that John said, for the tax collectors, people asked him, what should we do? Right? He said, those who have two tunics, give one away. For the tax collectors, don't collect more than you have to. Right? 
Zacchaeus has probably heard that. People have probably heard these messages from John and from Jesus. They were well known. But Zacchaeus goes a step further. He says, half of my goods I give away. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. There was this great sense of restitution. Not just doing the letter of the law, but truly living your life in a way that reflected what Jesus wanted. And Jesus says to him, truly today salvation has come to this house, for you are a son of Abraham. Even more so than this reflects what, what John was saying in Luke 3, that being a child of Abraham didn't simply mean having the lineage of Abraham, but that there was this new thing that was happening. And not even new, it was an old idea, actually, this idea that faith brought you in to be a child of Abraham, into the family of Abraham, into the promises that God had for that family. We've seen it through the Old Testament as well, uh, maybe through Joseph's sons, who were Egyptian, maybe through Rahab, who was a Canaanite woman, who entered the family of God through, not lineage, but faith. Radical faith. We end the story, uh, this narrative story, with, with Jesus saying this about himself. Okay. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. How will he seek and he save? I, first, I think it's worth noting that Jesus cared deeply for, for this idea of seeking those who were lost. The last time I came, I spoke on Luke 15 about the parable of the lost son. And I think we were reminded of the ways in which God desperately cares for those who are lost. He cares desperately for saving. God cared deeply again for those who were lost and sought to bring them back to him, even at a great cost to himself. Jesus is now reminding them that he, he, Jesus, is the way to the kingdom of God. And even as he draws near to his destination, he's actively seeking out people who are cast aside by society, forming relationship with them, as a way of foreshadowing his ultimate goal of bringing reconciliation with God to people through his death on the cross. I think this is important too. What, why was it so important for Jesus to eat with Zacchaeus? I know we've kind of gone through the story, but we haven't answered this key question. Why was it so important that Jesus stay with Zacchaeus? Okay, Luke again, 7. Uh, we're going to be pulling again from a lot of places. Luke, Luke 7. Said, uh, Jesus says this, okay, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him. A glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. In our passage, we see that Jesus, again, calls himself the Son of Man. He gives his purpose for his earthly ministry, for coming. Right? He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. Um, in Luke 7, we hear the same phrase, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. What a really ordinary thing to do, <laughs> right? And yet I think in church terms, what we have here is seeking and saving the lost is almost this vision or mission that he had, okay? And maybe eating and drinking was uh, the strategy that he had to accomplish that, that vision and that mission. Maybe that wasn't necessarily just eating and drinking, but... When you ate with someone, it was, it was a sign of intimacy. It was a sign of relationship and respect. You wouldn't share a meal with someone who you didn't deem worthy. I think that idea is especially relevant to us today. I think through the COVID pandemic, I did not eat with people for a very long time. Right? And if I was going to invite you into my home, or if I was going to go to your house, I probably had to know you very, very well. I had to trust you. This idea of sharing a meal is intimate. It requires trust. It requires respect. And when you sit down with people, you, you, you get to know them. I think even about, uh, Ani and I have started going to, we, we started going to Common Ground actually relatively recently. Last, well I guess not that recently now. Maybe it's been one year now. Um, and it was really hard. We entered the church when it was over Zoom. And so we felt like we kind of knew people, we had talked with people. Um, but as we started to be able to get to sit down with people and have a meal with them, that's when we really started to connect. And this is a weird thing that you can't really explain. You talk about the same stuff, but there's just a different sense to it, a different feel to it. And so he had to sit down with Zacchaeus. It wasn't just about acknowledging him where he was, but it was saying, I am willing to come to your home to initiate this deep relationship with you, 
to acknowledge that you are worthy of being known as well. And I think this is interesting, right? I think this is interesting. Um, I, I grew up at a Chinese church called Chinese Evangelical Church down in Hillsboro. It was interesting there. I think uh, they have a lot of outreach stuff. They have uh, they support missionaries overseas, and I think without uh, and this unspoken crux of how they how they reach people is that they are a community of Chinese American. So when there are Chinese immigrants who come over to the Portland area, whether it's to work at Intel or Hillsborough, or wherever it is, right, there's this understanding that there's a community of Chinese Americans who have done this before. They've navigated this weird way of you know, trying to figure out which schools are the best schools that they should send their children to these neighborhoods. Where should you live? Where can you get Chinese groceries? And there was a sense of, you know, they reached out to people because there was a sense of belonging for them. They could connect, get these things that they needed. They could be known. There was this comfortability that they could know. And that's really how they outreach, right? They would uh, help people to feel like they belong, even before they believe. Okay. And it was this weird thing. <laughs> I remember I, was, I, I, I wrote a paper on this at Western, and I think it's just a weird thing to Western culture. It's like, well, no, but what are you doing to reach your community? <laughs> and it's different. It was simply having this relationship, forming this relationship, um, and, and it was foreign. Right? This idea is foreign to us. Again, I think Jesus knew that humanity was made for relationship. Uh, it, it was made; they were made to be given the dignity of being known. I think it's even cooler again uh, that Jesus in, in Luke seven uses the language of that wisdom is justified by all her children. We find that Jesus calls that he is a son of Abraham, and indeed Jesus' wisdom and his approach to ministry, while it didn't make sense to the Pharisees or to the people at the time, produced the fruit of faith in people like Zacchaeus. It was effective. And again, there's an upside downness to the kingdom of God that Jesus is talking talking about in inaugurating. There's a way that the people had known at the time that Jesus was saying, you know, maybe, maybe this is not the way. He's saying, I am the way. He says, I am the truth and the life. The way, the truth, and the life, no one enters the Father except through me. And he's showing us what being like him looks like. What being a part of him looks like. What being on the way, in the way, looks like. I think it, it requires us to shake up a lot of what we know. I think what's so crazy is that the pandemic, as terrible as it was, helped us in that. Churches for a long time had been centered around this Sunday gathering, this weekly gathering, we have to be person. And that's kind of what we centered everything around. The pandemic kind of took that away from us. I think when we look, think back on it, right, I think it's, it's important for us to move forward saying, okay, well, what was God teaching us at the time? How is he saying, you have made now for yourself this idea of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. I'm going to take that away and help you figure out what's important. There's this upside down this too. I was talking to this young man the other day, and um, you know, we had this pretty regular conversation. He had just moved back from school. Uh, he was living with his parents, talking about a little bit about his uh, rocky relationship with his parents. And then I asked him this question. I said, you know, you're here maybe for a year and you want to leave, whatever, right? Like, what, what do you hope for in this year that you're here? He said, you know, I, he's like a good Christian kid. He said, you know, I have a sin in my life that I just want to stop. I want to get over it. He said, that's like the big thing that's consuming me right now. I, I thought to myself, that's good. First, that's good. Don't, don't hear me say that that's bad. But we've built up for this idea for ourselves that, you know, all these things that we think are important for our faith, for being a good Christian, is, oh, we have to stop sin. We have to be perfect. And I said to him, I said, listen, I think so much so, we built this idea of what it means to be a Christian that we miss out on the things that God is placing in front of us. Again, I, I told him, you know, I think that's really important. I want to help you do that. And, you know, why don't we go back to this thing that we glossed over about you, you and your relationship with your parents, right? How can I help you to see that this is an important part about what it means to be a follower of Christ. To have these strong, deep relationships with people. It will get to your sin, right? I, I, I grew up similarly. Right? I, part of it was being Chinese-American. 
I, I grew up with this idea that you know I had to be good. I had to be good. Um, you know, I, I you know my parents didn't explicitly tell me. No one really explicitly told me, but maybe implicitly I knew that if I was good, right, the aunties and uncles at church would all all give me some positive affirmation. You know, at, at school maybe it was this idea that being good helped me to not stand out as much among my predominantly white peers. And maybe part of it was. You know, I had seen, heard stories about my friends who had to move because their parents necessarily weren't good at their jobs, right? So they lost either their jobs, had to move to a different city, or had their visa revoked. And I slowly built up this idea of what it meant to be a person. And even more so than as a Christian, you know, you add this idea of eternal weight to sin and to messing up. And even more so than how important it was to be perfect, to be good. I think God doesn't ask that of us. In his infinite wisdom knew that maybe we weren't those people. <laughs> we weren't Jesus. And we see that in Zacchaeus. He approaches Zacchaeus and he says, you know, I want to be in relationship with you wherever you're at. In this tree. <laughs> as a chief tax collector, as a small man. I want to be in relationship with you. And it was powerful. I, I, I can guarantee you that as, as Zacchaeus turned his life around, as people witnessed this, that People saw the power of Jesus Christ. They saw the power of the presence that he had. And so maybe for, for, for us, we have built up this idea of what it means to be a good Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. And I want to tell you that maybe he has something else in store for you. Maybe there are things that he's placing right in front of you that don't seem as important as being good or perfect or sinless. But they are important power of simply being with the people that he's placed around you. I want to encourage you to do that. Okay? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and to save the lost. I, I, and I want to encourage you to, again, to, we, we have programs to reach out. I think you guys are doing a really cool thing, by the way, with um, the families from, from Afghanistan and the families from Senegal to reach out to them. You guys are doing a really cool thing. And I want to encourage you in your personal lives, outside of programs, outside of outreach, how can you be reaching out and inviting people into a knowledge and relationship, intimate relationship? Um, how can you enter into those with people that you don't think to? Jesus actually says, you know, when you throw a banquet, right, don't invite the people that you know. Don't invite your brothers, your sisters, your friends. Don't invite people in high places or rich people. Invite the people that don't have anything that could benefit you, that couldn't possibly invite you back or repay you. And he says, invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind. How can we be seeing those people today? How can we be calling them by name, inviting them, or I guess inviting yourself over to their, their place for, for a meal? In 2 Corinthians 5, um, we are told of, of again, Jesus' ministry. It says this, right? For starting verse 7, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Through Christ, we were given this relationship, this intimate, deep relationship, not only with Him, but with God the Father. And he's calling us as we are reconciled, as He comes to know us, as He comes to intimately know us, and have a relationship with us. He's calling us to, to do the same for others. Knowing that we have been changed by the power and the presence of Christ, that we can share that and affect others and have them see that through the way we live as well. And again, it's upside down. And it's also this duality of being extremely normal. Simply being in relationship with one another. I want to encourage you to do that at this point. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, again, I want to thank you for this time. God, uh, I thank you for even just the story in Luke about Zacchaeus. God, just to, just to catch a glimpse of you was enough for him. God, 
you recognize that and you met him where he was. Father, I'm really reminded of, of, of Isaiah. God, when he when he has a vision of you and he catches just a glimpse of your throne room, he is he is struck speechless. Father, he is acutely aware of his sin. And so, Father, for us, I pray that uh, you would show yourself to us. God, as we catch just a glimpse of you, just a word from you, we recognize the ways in which we have built up for ourselves, through our culture, through our society, through which what we think we know, our own wisdom of what it means to be a follower of you. God, what it means to do good. God, we, we pray that you would just help us to reshape that. That you would remind us of the things that you care about. God, that we were made for relationship. To simply see one another. And God, that you remind us of the power of that. Father, I pray that you would give us um, eyes to see, yes, you and those around us. Father, I pray that you would give us courage, courage to sit down with people that we wouldn't necessarily want to sit down with. And God, that you would just help us to love like you have loved us first. We thank you and pray all your son's name. Amen.